It is one of the greatest engineering feats of all time. A miracle made of brick and mortar that defied the doubters and helped inspire the Renaissance. The dome of the Florence Cathedral, built 600 years ago by a goldsmith with no training as an architect who dared to attempt the impossible. He constructs the dome at a time where the technology should not have permitted it. It just should not have been possible. Constructed of over four million bricks, weighing 40,000 tons, it's the largest masonry dome the world has ever known. Yet the methods used to build it remain a mystery. Now, a professor obsessed with the dome's secrets joins forces with a team of American bricklayers to put his theory to the test. The other bricks. I had to figure it out myself because the builder didn't write anything down and he didn't leave anything behind. This must be the way they have done it. This would be the only way that it makes sense. Great Cathedral Mystery. Right now, on this Nova National Geographic special, certain features of the dome stand out. It's in the shape of a pointed arch with eight sides rising to a central point, topped by an enormous marble lantern. But there is more to it than meets the eye. The exterior tiles conceal walls containing over four million bricks. And what appears to be a single solid structure is actually two domes, one inside the other. The interior dome covers an open space nearly half the length of a football field, while the outer shell rises 10 stories atop cathedral walls themselves 170 feet high. Questions about how the dome was built persist to this day. Six centuries ago, how could builders work at such great heights? How could they know the eight sides would meet in the center? And how did the steep brick walls hold together without collapsing? The mystery of the dome has taken such a hold on him that for nearly 25 years, Ricci's been building a dome of his own in a park in a residential neighborhood in Florence, employing what he believes to be Brunelleschi's methods. He began construction in 1989. Since then, the model has served as an open-air laboratory, with Ricci playing the role of Brunelleschi and crews of architecture students putting his ideas into effect. Ricci insists his approach is the only way to answer questions that have mystified scholars since the Renaissance. I was the only one who felt the need to build a model on such a grand scale to understand more deeply all the secrets hidden within the dome. Now, Ricci's experiment is at a crucial point in the process. With over 400 tons of masonry in place, the walls are beginning to bend inward. The pull of gravity is unrelenting, and the danger of collapse is very real. Soon, it could be too risky for students to continue the work. To understand the dome, you have to go through the problems of the bricklayers. Whoever doesn't do this is going to make a big fool of themselves. Delle grandi brutte figure. Cento, te dai spostati un po' qua. Basta. In the Renaissance, there were no lasers, computer-animated models, or detailed blueprints to guide the process. Builders relied on ropes to control the progress of the work. Ricci is convinced that the secret to the dome has something to do with a special way Brunelleschi used rope lines to establish how each brick should fit into place. No, troppa, 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 troppa. No, no. Ricci's dome is one-fifth the size of Brunelleschi's, but still huge. 
large enough, he hopes, to prove his theory of the secret of the dome correct. He and his helpers are preparing for its biggest test yet. With the walls increasing in height, Ricci is concerned about having his students continue the work. So a new team has arrived in town to help push Ricci's experiment forward. Good morning. Good morning. They are all master bricklayers from the United Don States. Morning. Nice to meet you, sir. They was talking Good morning. Don Hunt, nice to meet you. I think we're starting here. <laughs> They're members of the International Masonry Institute, an organization that trains workers in the craft of bricklaying. Quarter inch, half inch, however many millimeters that is. <laughs> no inches here. No, no, it's millimeters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Each one has more than 20 years on the job. Not in Florence for the food or the works of art. They are here to lay some brick. There you go, perfect. Most walls are built by simply laying bricks along straight lines, one after another, layer upon layer. Russell Gentry, a professor of engineering at Georgia Tech, has studied Brunelleschi's methods. So if Brunelleschi had built uh, the wall in the simple way you see here, you would have layers of brick and layers of mortar. And the layers of brick and layer of mortar are very simply separated by one another. And the layers of mortar represent planes of weakness through the wall. What we see here is that the wall is leaning in. Gravity is pulling it in towards me. And so a crack could form in one of the layers of mortar. The mortar is weaker than the brick. And the whole thing could rotate, and all of this brick could fall in. The time had come for Brunelleschi to share part of his secret plan with the world. That's the point in the building where support of some sort was always needed. And Brunelleschi had to begin using this special pattern of laying bricks that he himself seems to have invented. In Brunelleschi's new design, horizontal bricks are interrupted by others set vertically. Instead of continuing in one straight line, the bricks zigzag. In the area between the two domes, that pattern is visible today, but only in small patches that remain unplastered. In Italian, the design is called spina pesce, spine of the fish. English speakers call it herringbone. I think we're having spina fiche for a dinner. <laughs> the herringbone design is even easier to spot in Massimo Ricci's dome. The pattern is simple. And it's a method the American bricklayers catch on to rapidly. Okay, good fit. They lay the vertical bricks first. These are the spines. Once the spines are set, the horizontal bricks are then wedged in between the spines, row after row. In all their years of working, the Americans have never seen bricks laid quite this way. It's completely different. The techniques are definitely, definitely way different than what we're used to. This system is pretty amazing, really. The vertical bricks in the Spina Pesce pattern block the mortar's planes of weakness. This prevents large sections of wall from separating or shearing and tumbling to the ground. If everything was laid uh, uh, horizontally and you just brought it in slowly each time, you would always have a shear point, a shear plane where that could slide off. Where here, you don't have any single shear point anywhere. It's all tied together a million times. 
Brunelleschi uses the Spina Pesce pattern to create a dome that looks like an octagon, but is actually one continuous spiral. So we're here looking at the corner of Massimo's dome. And what we can see behind the corners, we see the start of the bedding of the masonry. And as we go up, we can see the bricks in the Spinapeske pattern. And if you watch carefully, you can see that they start here and they wrap up around behind the corner and continue uninterrupted from one face of the dome to the other face of the dome. By simply turning some bricks on their sides, Brunelleschi establishes a new pattern and achieves two important goals, preventing cracks from spreading and binding the eight walls into one unified mass. The spiral form resists the forces of gravity more effectively than an eight-sided dome. For many, Spina Pesce is the secret of the dome. But the construction of the dome involved many secrets, something the American bricklayers have come to understand from their time with Massimo Ricci. Yeah, but look at that, that's one piece. After two weeks on the job, they're ready to compare their work to the real thing. The interior dome is completely covered by a religious mural. Wow. The area between the shells offers only glimpses of key elements. This is the corner rib. See that? Yes. This would be, that would be an interior rib. And plaster conceals all but a few patches of brickwork. As you can still see, here's a good illustration of Spina Fischia. Oh, man. This is unbelievable. Yes. It's scary looking, isn't it? It really is. <laughs> we can't be complaining about anything over our little one-fifth scale about no. 10 feet off the ground anymore. No. Okay. <laughs> On the way down, the workers notice something that escapes all but the most experienced eye. You see this, guys? See how this is coming up to mm -hmm. the center, just like on the model? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see that? Yeah. Both of these, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the horizontal arch right there. The bricks are sloping down from the corner ribs toward the centers of the walls. The massive scale of the dome makes it difficult to see. Ricci incorporated the flower into the work platform of his model, using it to guide each wall's construction. Rope lines are important building tools even today, and the Americans catch on quickly to Ricci's system. One worker stationed on the platform hooks a line to the flower. Another on the top of the wall handles the other end of the rope. The rope controls the angle and the height of the bricks. Can you see now? Hey, can you hold that there for a second? Concentrate on this one right here that's moving. The one that Bob has a hold of, yep. it sets the line up for that Spina Fisher. So it's essentially their guide. And that's why the shape of the flower is so important. As the platform worker moves the line along the flower, the rope transfers the curve of the flower to the wall. This creates the inverted arch. The walls may be strong, but for the dome to work, they must meet together at the top. One small miscalculation, repeated hundreds of thousands of times, would lead to disaster. Here's the angle. And as you go up, it should follow that all the way up. Say, so if this was not correct, as you get that dome closing up to the top, it's not going to want to hit in the middle. So you might, you know, the dome might be this way, or it might be this way. How could Brunelleschi know his dome was on the right track? The answer is in the lines. Crisscrossing from wall to wall, they establish the center point. And before any rope line guides a brick into place, 
it must pass through that center. Brick by brick, the walls of Brunelleschi's dome rise until they meet at the top, nearly 300 feet in the sky, and the dome is complete. For Ricci, the ropes guiding the bricks provide the real key to the mystery of the dome. I can say with the utmost certainty, this is the true secret of Santa Maria del Fiore. Essere il vero segreto di Santa Maria del Fiore. After two weeks of working on Ricci's dome, the Americans seem convinced by his experiment. This must be the way they have done it. Without putting a support underneath there, this would be the only way that uh, it makes sense. This is the flower, and it's the herringbone pattern. Those are the two things that solve the puzzle. You wouldn't be able to, to build a dome like that without those control measures. Massimo Ricci has now been working on his dome longer than it took Brunelleschi to build the original. His model will remain an open laboratory for those studying Brunelleschi's methods and as an argument for the importance of the flower. It's possible that Ricci, unlike his hero, will never see his work finished. But if you look at the, the, the dates of the building, 1420 to 1436, 16 years. That's the blink of an eye. That's very, very quick. And it's wonderful to think that he saw it completed. He was able to look at it. He was able to walk past the building and think to himself, I built that, I did that. With the dome, Florence moves into an entirely different dimension. The dome becomes the hub of a new city, of a new world. It is the expression of a self-confidence uh, that no longer knows limits. People need works that can speak to them of their own capacity to dream. Brunelleschi's Dome is perhaps the biggest of those works in the history of world art.